Here we go. Okay, we are at the panel stage. Um, yeah, I think a lot of content. I mean, I, I was really interested in the MPI um, part, but the others was, of course, also super interesting. So where do we want to start? Um, you guys have anything on your plate that you want to get rid of first, get out of the way first? Okay, then I mean, I, I will start with, with Bill's presentation. I think the one thing that we encounter here again is, like you talked about the graph problem in Docker, right? Um, and that the content, like the image management piece cannot be shared, the graph cannot be shared, and also the snapshot management cannot be shared. I mean, this is, of course, it's a, it's a bummer, but it, in the future, maybe Docker will use container D to its fullest, and then we can share the snapshot and the content plugin. So that might be might be released. But for all of the HPC runtimes, that's kind of not a problem, right? Because snapshotting is using shared file systems, so we're good there, right? Just wanted to make sure that we we um, understand the the differences here. So for, for Docker, that's a problem. For what we talk about most of the time, it's not, right? Yeah, and, and, and we're also looking at uh, actually moving to container D or cryo um, at scale, only because we've seen there's a, there's a, a current issue with the Docker end, so it's a plague issue. Um, so we are looking at moving to different container runtimes, and Kubernetes allows or affords us to do so. So um, as we get more experience with orchestration at scale uh, for HPC, we'll be looking at different runtimes and integrating those uh, with the community's help, um, at, you know, on our on our systems. But um, yeah, you're, you're right. It's still it's 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 a bit of a, an issue. And as I said, it's a bit of a naive solution. Um, we've scaled it to hundreds of nodes, but not thousands. And that goes back to a comment yesterday, right? So is, is, is our running cloud native apps on HPC systems in, in the order of thousands of nodes, or is it in the order of hundreds of nodes? Um, considering the market today is AI and ML. Um, so a, a, again, it's the vision. You know, where do we want to push orchestration and where do we want to push the cloud native technologies? Uh, yeah. yeah. And and also, I mean, we don't need to spend super uh, like a long, lot of time or not enough time of it. But as you 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 also said in in other segments, there is a like a convergence of having multiple runtimes. Maybe like have Kubernetes using Docker or Container D, and then have maybe the HPC part being executed by. Singularity, Shifter, Charlie Cloud, Cyrus, whatever. But with that, you you have different storage mechanisms for snapshots and for images, and you will have multiple times the same data basically placed somewhere, right? And if we could maybe adopt, and it goes to Luca, I think, as well, if we could adopt maybe the Cyrus WashFS file system as a, as a plugin for Container D so that you can use the same the same image snapshots for both of the schedule, both of the execution environments, then you would save some some time by downloading it, and you would make sure that you have the same data under your under your feet. That's something that we could consider having a HPC snapshot plugin for Container D, so that we can live off the same snapshot data. Or is it, I mean, I said, it's not a, like, it just popped into my head and I thought I would like to talk about it briefly, but it, it's not the most important piece, I think. I'm trying, I'm trying to imagine how, uh, how would that, uh, how would that fit together? So why the squash of S image? Why, why do you think that that would make sense? I mean, for, for diskless nodes, the problem that Bill and I, like we talked about it a couple of times already, like mm -hmm. not workshop but uh, offline if you if you want to snapshot an image with docker you need first to download it to your local content cache 
or the local content like image repository, and then you can snapshot it. So you cannot just snapshot something directly from the registry. You need to download it, the tarball yeah. basically, and then you snapshot it. Yeah. If we would have container the plugins for content, a distributed one where you don't need a local content store, a local image store, but use some shared image store, maybe just a metadata thing that just checks whether that's available in your uh, somewhere on a, on a shared file system, and a shared content, a shared snapshotting plugin where you maybe use SquashFS images or RNC as well, then we could leverage both leverage the data stores for uh, both execution environments. If Saros run use the same snapshot, then a Docker run would use. Mm -hmm. But again, maybe that's food for thought. I think uh, like let's let's just move on um, to to maybe a different thing. That's just something I thought like if people would would spark uh, light up, then uh, we can dive deeper into it. But you don't, so okay. I, I, would, I would say though, just on that, there are several snapshotting or shared file systems out there. I know Google has one and CERN was, you know, has one as well. So I think it's something we need to look at as, you know, as we move forward. Um, this, this notion of diskless nodes at scale is a, is, is a problem for some of the, you know, the more general cloud native technologies. Yeah, indeed, I second that. I mean, that's, uh... That's one of the big differences, you know, when you when you deploy standard or, 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 or cloud-like containers, right? It's one of the yeah. first hurdles you run into. Yeah, it's what led to it was like one of the reasons we had to to, to develop custom HPC runtimes was because of the lack of of local disk on most of these systems. And then also, I think even if you'd had local disk, being able to do scalable launch. You still need some, I think you need some better solutions there. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And I said it just an, as a, so, some idea that I just popped up. And I would like to link what Bill talked about, the workload manager integration with the, the, the couple of bind mounts you did for the spool directories with what um, Josh talked about when he talked about the resource manager PMI server client model. Is the server client model in PMI like getting us around this this mount points that you, you showed, Bill? So it seems like you needed to execute or access a couple of directories to submit jobs and to know what's going on in in, in Slurm. Is that the case? Um, yeah, and, and and this is all based on, you know, Cray has its own scalable job launcher, right? So, so again, architecturally, um, today at least, even with the, you know, Cray has its own Cray PMI as well. Um, we, we, we have some architectural uh, uh, differences between running native and running in a container. So unfortunately, we have to do some of these um, bind mounts to bring that knowledge into the container environment because that's what the application is linked with and that's what it's gonna to need to look at. Um, universally, like with PMIX or PMI2, I'm, I'm, it's better outside my scope of knowing what the requirements are there. I just know for on Cray systems today with our launches and our PMI, we have to do this, this um, um, workaround. Yeah, and one of the advancements that we designed into PMIX was the ability for you not to have to link in the PMIX library from outside the container in. And that took a lot of effort for cross-version compatibility. So we had to worry about the PMIX library inside the container being of a different version than the PMIX library used by the resource manager. And they need to still negotiate that and talk at that level. Um, that's was the design point early on inside of PMIX is something that we uh, aggressively maintain. But as you kind of saw in my talk, it's a it's a pretty difficult thing to maintain, right? Over time, the two are going to drift, and you need to make sure that older and newer versions can talk together uh, across this uh, wire protocol. So one of the things that we're looking at with the PMIX standard 
is seeing if we can make that connection, that wire protocol between the two sides uh, more robust so that it's easier for um, different, say, PMIX libraries uh, implementations to exist on both sides, which is not something that you can really easily do today. But um, PMIX was kind of designed with the, the notion that you don't have to bind mount in the system one if you don't want to, because uh, bind mounting, as was mentioned before, uh, brings a host of other things in with it that you have to worry about. Right? So PMI is then, and and I mean, I, I think I knew it before, but it, it just, I just realized it, I think. So it's not only, I thought it's all, all about like MPI startup and using the, or creating this RD and MPI domain basically, and try to wire up everything. But it's also an integration with the resource manager. That's also the second big part of PMI then. And you can do generic resource manager queries and submissions and like, crude um, um, uh, crude calls to the the scheduler say okay I want a new job to be scheduled I want uh, I want to resize myself uh, I want to like create a new job that's a sidecar of myself it's all these things that you can do with it. yes yeah so PMI uh, I'll talk about PMI but PMI X um, we really focused it's a generic interface between a client um, such as MPI or um, OSHMEM or something, some kind of runtime client and the resource manager. So you have an API between the two now that you can use. The tricky part of it is that each resource manager tends to have uh, what we call attributes that are specific to it, something that it knows and, and wants to use. And so the client does have to have a sense of what the resource manager is, but the API stays the, the same. And um, and like I said, we're building a standard around that. But speaking of schedule interaction, so we interact with the resource manager, which is you know managing processes within, say, your allocation or even an orchestrator uh, like Kubernetes. You can deal with that too. But we do have scheduler interface and job control interfaces where you can do things like ask for more nodes in your allocation or give back nodes from your allocation. The onus is then on the resource manager to then implement kind of the back end piece and take it the rest of the way because it knows how to interact with you know LSF or Slurm or or what have you um, as the resource manager. And right now um, we call that kind of more of a dynamic mode. And in the PMIX standard group, we have a dynamics uh, working group that meets uh, every other Friday. And they're looking at Spark and Kubernetes and traditional batch schedulers to see if we can take that piece of the PMIX interface and actually connect it in a dynamic way to the resource manager and scheduler so that we can do things like we were talking about earlier in the week um, for adding and removing nodes, playing with node allocations, those kind of things. And so if you're interested in that, I would encourage you to, to dial into that group and, and listen to some of the, the really neat stuff that's going on there, some of the proof of concepts. All right, so it's so you can like use PMI to to let different schedulers talk to each other as well. Can I? Yeah, like, it depends on the back end piece. Yeah, and if like if Kubernetes schedules a Slurm job, then they can exchange ideas and exchange resource allocations between each other, or am I like? I'm just like thinking in, on the, but. in between the individual resource managers that gets uh, it's not well explored um, but certainly if PMIX could play a role there that is helpful we can explore that it's mostly between the say MPI application and the resource manager or your dynamic spark application and the resource manager asking for you know more nodes or or fewer nodes in the allocation as it uh, explores the domain that it's working on. Do you want to say any more about the interaction between like Kubernetes and Slurm as an example via uh, PMAX? Um, I don't have too much knowledge in that particular connection, um, but you could within the back end piece have the two, we have some back end plugins inside of Open PMIX, which is the reference implementation that's out there. Um, for the resource manager to connect to 
say the scheduler, the workload manager, the fabric, um, or the file system. And we could explore, you know, building that out a little bit to have it connect to multiple and assist in an exchange. Um, I don't know of anybody who's done that to date, but certainly that would be an interesting thing to explore in the working groups. So as in some of the examples that we use, we essentially take uh, clusters and divide them into subclusters that are exclusively managed by either Kubernetes or Slurm and never the same. Um, I know there are people that are looking at doing one on top of the other where you'll say, hey, uh, use Kubernetes to set up a set of pods and then use Slurm within the pod that you've set up for managing it. And you know it's all or nothing. It gets it, and um, then you can go use it. Um, but having, I don't know of anybody, I would love to hear if anybody has really tried or has any particular compelling usage model for trying to have uh, Kubernetes and Slurm or some other scheduler sort of uh, contend and agree on and handshake among themselves about, okay, who has these particular resources now? I don't, I don't know that that's an interesting case yet. Bill, you've done some investigation there, right? Yeah. So, so, you know, the use case that the, the, that we've looked at is um, when we provision nodes, uh, the nodes can either be Slurm nodes or, or Kubernetes nodes, right? They're just a vanilla, but they're running both demons. So, going back to a discussion yesterday, um, you have to have one owner of the resources and how to do that. Um, so what we've experimented with is using Kubernetes as a framework, it's, it's, it's more adaptable. And having a schedule of plugin that actually checks in with Slurm. So really Slurm is the master scheduler of all the system, but Kubernetes schedulers can go check in with Slurm uh, through, through a web plugin to see whether that node is gonna be allocated or not through the Slurm context. So it's a way of having a, um, sort of a hybrid scheduling model. So we're not setting up these rigid pools or, or partitions of nodes. One is just Kubernetes, one is Slurm. It's the whole system can either, can operate in either workload. Um, that is one, we, you know, there's, there's, there's challenges there. Um, I also know that Altair, PBS, uh, they've also have a, a scheduler plugin um, to Kubernetes that basically does the same thing. Instead of using the, the Kubernetes scheduler, um, southbound type of APIs, it, it uses the, the Alter scheduler southbound a, APIs, and that's how it, that's how it uh, sort of negotiates which node is being used for which purpose. So there are a couple of use cases out there. I don't know, as I said yesterday, I don't know how it's all gonna roll out and, and, and the actual business use cases for doing so, but um, there are some challenges, but I can see a, I can see a use case there. Is what you just described for HPE essentially a production usage or an experiment, an experimental sandbox? Um, prove that it could work. Yeah, it's 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 pushing some architectural limits, right? Um, you know what you know what do we want to do and how we want to provision the systems. Uh, ultimately, the the users or the you know the the customers have the the choice of allocating the nodes to whichever. Um, orchestrator or scheduler they want. This was one of those proof points of having both schedulers running at the same time on the system and having it more dynamic. But but on this, the, the I mean, Kubernetes of course can be dynamic so that like nodes go and nodes come, it doesn't really like you, it can be dynamically and can, can be, can breathe. But Slurm, you need, you have a fixed set of nodes, right? So if, if uh, something, being scheduled at from from a different scheduler, then you will just put a, a job there that just allocates the whole the whole node, so that uh, maybe Kubernetes can schedule something on the Slurm on the Slurm node. Or do you take the node out of of Slurm to make this happen? Well, that's why you're having Slurm or the scheduler be the authority, right? Yeah, yeah. Because it has more stringent standards. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Slurm. Yeah. So that was there. Yeah, that was what I'm. Yeah. Okay. So Slurm is. You can ask, and if they're free, then I'll give them to you. But if they're not, you can't have them. I'm going to yeah. keep using them. But wouldn't it be nice to have a sidecar like a Slurm job running, and then a sidecar scheduled by Kubernetes on the same node? I mean, okay, you will add jitter, and you will add. You will take performance, but. Uh, there are some, uh, so we say, edge cases that that might be useful for doing introspection on what's like MPI ranks running. If you could do a Kubernetes job and have some diagnostics or monitoring software running, um, again, it's use cases, right? So, if people find that hybrid use case interesting, I'm I'm, I'm sure I'm sure uh, development can go on, but it's. Uh, uh, yeah, we have looked at that, but I, I'm, I'm struggling to find solid use cases rather than research paper use cases. So yeah. e even in that case, I would think that, you know, if you've got a Slurm job and you know that you want to monitor your MPI rank or whatever it is it's going, you deploy that as part of Slurm. I'm having a hard time piecing together how you would have a Slurm job and say, oh, and by the way, in the, in the side with this Kubernetes thing, I also want to be monitoring that. And Slurm doesn't know about it, and you know, yeah, yeah. How, how's that work? As I said, it's it's a it's a researchy paper type of thing, you know. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. I mean, usually you're allocating resources in HPC, and you're very stringent on those resources. Having this sidecar or other application running uh, and using resources can actually be a bad thing. So. Um, it's one of those possibilities, um, as I said, you know, do people really want to use it? I'm, I'm not sure. And again, sorry to go back to this, but just for clarity, uh, the case that you were talking about before where uh, Slurm and Kubernetes are working together, that was a production use, right? Not just a, an experiment. Uh, experiment. Okay. So we did it. Uh, we have a production use of LSF and Kubernetes working in a similar way um, with a client, and um, and so what we do there is the biggest aspect of that that you want is you want a single brain scheduler for the whole environment, and let Kubernetes do all of the good stuff with orchestrating and maintaining a service that it's good at, and the batch scheduler doing its thing, but one scheduler that knows the whole system. And so we have a, a similar thing that you're, you're describing with Slurm, but with LSF for us. And it looks at the whole cluster and manages it. We do not share a single node between both Kubernetes and a, and a bare metal job for exactly the reasons we were talked about. Um, but we do allow the system in to kind of dial where that wall is between the two. So as maybe more use cases that happen at the Kubernetes side, you can move more nodes into that uh, pool versus the LSF side. So. Um, they have some interesting use cases for that, but it's mostly, you know, kind of blending and bringing in applications. So I think it's kind of a young set of use cases, and I'd really like to see some of those um, described out. Joshua, yeah. if I could, uh, Josh, if I could ask a question on that. Do you, when you're running in that mode, do the, do the Kubernetes, um, you know, services or applications or whatever, do you have to tweak them anyway? Like you have to specify that you're going to schedule it using the the LSF scheduler extension, or is it just you just submit it like you would any other Kubernetes app? So in the examples that I've seen, you have to supply the scheduler, and then any LSF specific options you want. Maybe you want to tell LSF when you submit the Kubernetes mm -hmm. YAML, you can add additional LSF annotations if that's helpful. You don't have to. Um, but I believe you can replace the default completely so that it's the default for everybody, even if they don't specify it. Um, okay. But the examples that I've yeah. seen, you've been explicit. That way you can bounce between the two. But you need to reboot for this then. So it's more like an, so you reboot in the either the LFS, LSF, in an LSF client or a Kubernetes client? The, the nodes are always running in LSF, um, and they may also have Kubernetes on them. Um, is the idea. So as you grow the Kubernetes site, if I'm understanding the question correctly, you would just add more nodes to the Kubernetes piece. LSF detects that through the etcd um, mechanism and, and then starts tracking them appropriately. So 
No, Josh, let, let me quickly uh, ask you, you mentioned uh, briefly about interesting use cases. If you can, can you quickly describe a, a couple of those use cases that benefit from such an architecture or such a combination of uh, LSF and Kubernetes? It's a great question. Um, I probably can't talk about specifics um, that I've seen from a client, but I can talk at a high level. So what you might have are, so one of the great things about containers is you can pick up somebody's uh, working binary, particularly in machine learning and AI, right? You have this container and it might have the orchestration mechanism with it designed for Kubernetes. And so you're bringing it into your system. You, f you can feed the data through a Kubernetes um, connection into the service and it works just like you found it to work to reproduce a workflow. And that's a very native Kubernetes thing. Could you decompose that and run it on bare metal? Probably, um, but it's already set up for Kubernetes. And so we have, you know, one use case is that, you know, I've picked this up and I want to run it in Kubernetes because that's what it's designed for. Um, another use case is actually connecting the two sides. And that's one that is probably more fledgling um, where I have something that is Kubernetes native and something that is bare metal and I want the two to talk. And you could think about, you know, steering applications, visualization, mm -hmm. those kind of things. And, I th and again, I think a lot of this is relatively new uh, in the HPC circles, um, but it is a really compelling type of hybrid system that I think will yield some benefits, particularly for applications that may be transitioning to one side or the other. It's a great environment to play with that. Yeah. So can you say more about that? that you're talking about, I know you're, uh, I'm not trying to tell you, get you to divulge what you can't hear, but just to be more clear, uh, you're suggesting that the bare metal would use LSF or whatever your scheduler is, and then uh, Kubernetes there. And there's a reason, what's the compelling reason you know, I get, if you're already using Kubernetes, you want to keep using that there. That part's easy. And for the bare metal part, um, is it that it needs to be scheduled uh, and managed as a schedule, for example, an HPC app that needs to have grab a certain number of resources and keep them, and that's why Kubernetes is not so uh, uh, appropriate, and that's why you're trying to get those two to work together? Is that the, the connecting the dots? Um, a little bit. So you have some traditional HPC apps that aren't going to be ported to cloud native and will struggle with that. And so they want the bare metal um, and that's okay. But they might be calling out and dumping data into a database that is shared and that could be on the Kubernetes side. That might be an, an interesting thing or a visualization pipeline that okay. used to be on bare metal, but it's now tra transitioned into a, a nice cloud service. Um, as long as you can connect the two sides, um, it'll be okay. Yeah, some of the some of the use cases that, that that we're trying to address also is along the same lines that we can either do uh, the traditional HPC sim simulation run because that's how the application is written, and then do post processing of the data through you know ML libraries and AI libraries, and 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 that was the I'd say the view of a few years ago of combining these into a hybrid workflow. Um, what we're beginning to see now is if you've got data, you can help steer the simulation so that the AI ML workloads are moving in front of the simulation, the traditional simulation. So they want to do some pre-processing work to work out basically how the simulation, HPC simulation is going to run. Maybe it needs less nodes. Maybe you can you know, manipulate the data a little so you don't need to do all the edge cases. So the, the 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 workflows are sort of getting <coughs> hybridized in a way of between HPC traditional and ML and AI, and that workflow happens before the simulations and after. And the frameworks that they want to use is like Kubernetes to help steer the application or steer the simulation and back. So we are seeing this this, and as I said it's it's more of a hybrid workflow. It's it's not the actual implementation how to run them it's how to steer these workflows through the system and they're wanting cloud native technologies and hpc technologies to run on the same system so i'll add one uh two which would be in distributed systems where things can get fragile at the edge uh i'll talk about this a little bit in the next session um then 
Kubernetes adds a lot of value for being able to set things up, provision, provision things, uh, deal with uh, changes in the hardware or other version configurations and so on there. Um, and if uh, what it is that you're running on the cluster that's at the edge also needs a scheduler, then it makes sense to do it there. However, that's still a hierarchical thing rather than a side-by-side -side one. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then the, the question be, becomes, the, where are you sharing the data between the, the two layers? Because the, at some point, you will run short. I mean, not everything can be streamed live, right? Or not everything can be done in real time. So at some point, you will need a place where to put the data that it will later be picked up by the, by the HPC part of the application or the post-processing run by Kubernetes. So uh, in my view, that's, uh, that's one of the first things that we had to think about because of parallel file systems, you know, the multi-tenancy that is uh, implicit there. And uh, in the Kubernetes side, that's not uh, as far as I understand, I'm not a Kubernetes expert, is uh, it's not so easy or not so clear how to do that, right? Mm -hmm. There's a challenge. What are the key gaps that you see with respect to uh, dealing with file systems in Kubernetes? Well, again, I'm not a Kubernetes expert, but uh, what I know is that, like in Docker, there are certain assumptions when uh, when you run. So thinking about a parallel file system with multiple users, if there is another scheduler, like for example, like Josh was mentioning, was mentioning like LSF that is taking care of setting everything up so that Kubernetes feels like in a cloud environment, then you are okay. But if you have different systems communicating with each other, then uh, there should be some kind of communication. And what I see is, is a, storage a storage layer being there communicating both. And that could be challenging. And in CSCS specific case, we are facing such challenges uh, when connecting a traditional HPC system like PSTIME and for example, an OpenStack cluster, right? Because there are different worlds. So don't parallel file systems already have to deal with that problem of clients operating on completely different kinds of systems still accessing the common set of data? And why isn't that it why isn't dealing with that problem the job of the parallel file system itself? Well, first off, because of multi-tenancy. So the an OpenStack installation or, or a VM will not see that parallel file system in the same way as uh, the HPC installation, right? As the HPC system. So one of the first requirements that you get from a, from a user to get a virtual machine is because they want to be root or they need to be root for some reason, you know, for some reason regarding the, the workflow. So how do you manage that? How do you- It's a privilege and access. For example, that, yes, that's an example, right? So how do you contain the privileges so that they serve the workflow and at the same time, they don't spill out in a parallel file system? So object storage is, is, is one option, for example, there. And I imagine, uh, I don't know, there may be some other approaches out there. That's why I was bringing this up. Yeah, I think there's certain... I mean, Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to comment on that. I mean, with like our deployment for services with with Spin, we do have a, a model for how um, at least to address that issue that you brought up, Lucas. And then um, I think that as we go towards uh, more the containers running as the end user, then that also helps ad address it. I'd, I'd say there are still some gaps, but. You know, you're just giving that as one example of a mismatch that occurs. I think there's there's other places where it happens too. Indeed, yes. So it's uh, I I think that is 
uh, I'm just trying to deconstruct that. It seems like the file system can and should deal with uh, all of the integration across the different kinds of systems and being able to communicate across nodes that are being managed through these different entities, one Kubernetes, one Slurm, et cetera. And the key issue is sort of the management of identity and privilege, et cetera, of who those end users are. And that you're looking to get some consistency across those, which you may be able to manage if they're all being orchestrated or scheduled by a single agent. But when you have multiple agents that have different notions of who this is and what rights they have and how that's being managed, that's the problem. Mm-hmm. And so it's not the file system itself, it's, no, no. Uh, but rather the interaction yes. of, with the file system as a, as a, with respect to identity. Is that true? Yes. Yes, exactly, exactly. It's but, not the file system per se, but it's uh, is uh, exactly what you are saying. It's the different perspectives and how they integrate together. But for, for Josh and Bill's example of having both LSF and Slurm and, and, uh, and Kubernetes running on the same host, do you have different interfaces to talk to the shared file system or is it always POSIX and you just need to teach um, the Kubernetes agent or the Kubernetes piece to, to play nice with the POSIX file system? Or do you just mount it via something else? Um, so in the examples that, that we've run, we, we just basically mount in the POSIX file system. I mean, Kubernetes will just see it as a file system that gets mounted into the pod. Um, and it's up to the application to do the, the right thing, to read right. Um, We've, we've seen issues, and this is going back a tad, uh, when we've been using Hadoop file systems, but back by Lustre. Um, Hadoop is not a POSIX file system. So when it was writing files to Lustre, and we would go through Lustre's API to look at the files, all the file permissions were wrong, right? But, but that's, uh, that's an API issue. Um, I think another thing that we've seen, and, and this is when we've in, interfaced to the cloud, is when we pull data from, say, Azure down to Lustre. Again, the, the file permission bits are not quite the same as what we expect. Again, it's not a POSIX file system that we're operating in. Um, so cloud file systems, S3, Azure, Blob, to HPC file systems, there needs to be a translation that has, has to happen to set the right permission bits, to set the right owners. Um, all that can be accomplished, but it's an extra tax that we have to do for this file, you know, file translation between the two environments. Um, but Kubernetes itself can see a POSIX file system. I mean, there's, 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 no, there's no real magic there. It can do that. Um, and then it's up to the application to do the right thing. Yeah, we've similar, um, mostly just exposing the, the file system up. I guess one tricky dimension to kind of build on that is uh, with user namespaces and the ranges of uh, UIDs and GIDs, parallel file systems are not really great about understanding that these days. And so if you're playing with that and a parallel file system, you have to be careful. And there's a ton of notes um, out there from you know, Podman and, and other uh, container runtimes that are playing with user namespaces uh, around this. And it just further complicates this a little bit. It is an area where we all need more work. And yeah. Could the, the, the shared file system client on the host deal with this and know about user namespaces and just know, okay, this, this user within the container is this user outside of the container, so I just translate everything that is done file I/O wise to this user so that it doesn't matter what user is is currently used within the container, it just says, okay, everything that comes from this C group or, or however we, we split it up can then say, this is user 5003 from the real POSIX file system tree. And I talked to some file system vendors back like in SC19 about it over beer, and I thought it was a good idea. Isn't that something we can do? Well, well something like that is what Podman is doing, if I'm not mistaken, right, with the SUE IDs. So is this remapping of, of of users? Saros does that in in, in slightly different way by just uh, forking the process of the container itself as the user that originally asked for the resources. So in that 
in that case, there is no translation. But Bodman, uh, as far as uh, Valentine is not here, right? But uh, he will be like the authoritative answer uh, for this one. But uh, as far as I know, with the sub IDs, that's exactly what is happening. And that is tricky, as Josh was mentioning. That is tricky because that means a lookup table for every single user that you have there needs to have a counterpart on that sub ID. Because I think the I issue occurs um, when, Christian, when you need to have distinguished different users running it within the container. And so then you have to map them to different ones kind of outside so you can separate them. Um, the fact is, for most of our applications, we don't care about that. They all run as one user, so you don't really need that. But you run into some examples where you do, and then you've got to have some mechanism for that. Do you have a usage model? Things basically sort of handles um, part of it. Sorry, I think my audio just switched. But if we if we assume that no matter what user, even if the user changes within the container, we would just want to have the outside user ID to be this when it comes down to the file system. It should be possible somehow. I mean, the thing is with user namespaces, you need to specify which user ID is running within the container, right? So you cannot just say, outside of the container, I'm user 5003, and inside, I don't care. It's a range of zero to 65,000, and everything is is um, dialed back to this one outside user. It's always an offset. So if you change it, then um, yeah, you, you won't be the same user outside, right? And with set UID, it's the same. Can you switch users with set UID in Cyrus, Lucas? No, no, you can't do that. No. Now we take all the, those capabilities out. Well, yeah, that would be really dangerous in most cases. Okay. And could you say more about your example of a uh, use case for distinguishing among users within a container? Um, let's say, I mean, I think it occurs more in a, for services. Um, so you might have, I want to run this service, you know, as root, but then have this other process that it forks run as, you know, an unprivileged user. And, you know, all of these things were designed in a pre-container kind of worldview. And so I think sometimes these things are, they're protections that make sense on if they're running outside of a container, but maybe make less sense when they're already containerized. Well, what you just said uh, spurred kind of where I was going with this is, uh, we talked yesterday about sort of the notion of no user. Like, you know, I don't care who this yeah. is, it's just like not, not, a, not a special user. And maybe that's, an adequate distinction uh, for many of these use cases, like the server, the services model you just suggested. Of mm -hmm. sometimes I got to be root or a guy that you know really uh, has the ackles to be able to do whatever. And other times, you know, just it's somebody with that's nobody special, and that may be enough as far as the container is concerned. Yeah, I I think so, and I think also that we could extend this to the image and say. There's no reason to distinguish users running inside this image. So you could, you know, you can flatten everything, and that would further simplify things. I think what's missing is we kind of need to rethink, you know, the services and other things that are kind of that predated containers and start to redo those to be a more container-native kind of approach. So before we leave this though, I can still imagine a case where I could say uh, to this service, hey, could you create this file for me? And when you create this file for me, I want it to go in this location, uh, which only I have access to, and or maybe it's a shared location, but I want it to have sort of my name on it so that I can tell when I go looking that I was the one that created that file as opposed to no user. And uh, you know, you might do a two-step thing where at the end of everything you go and uh, do the appropriate chone or something at the end. Um, but I can imagine where 
as a proxy for each of many different users, you may still want that. Is that, have you seen such use cases? I, I personally have not had cases yet where we've tried to do these kind of sidecar approaches with containers. Um, I mean, I can envision some. I think that in many cases you might wonder, like, could could that sidecar just run as the user as well? You know, the, I think you'd have to look at what are the cases where the sidecar needs some privilege to do its function versus it's just another piece of code that you want to run to maybe collect information or something like that. And you might need two, you know, different approaches for those two different use cases. Okay, so we move on from, from this POSIX thing. And of course, I mean, I, I think it's clear that we need to dive into this at some other point a little bit deeper as well. Um, I'd like, the, just as a follow-up, Christian, I think it'd be good to figure out who the expert, other expert voices are here and gather that as a, a conversation so we can really figure out what are the gaps and, and how do we close them. Happy true. To, do that in the uh, containers. And with some concrete use cases, I think would also be would be good. Yeah, I don't know how to find those people. Maybe the file system vendors, if they have an idea about it. But yeah, let's see. For from to like and also to to wrap up PMI. Maybe there was a question from someone in Slack. Um, the question was, given that the host system does not have PMIX, is installing PMI2 inside the container mandatory to interact with Slurm with PMI2 on the host? Is Can you run something within the container in PMI without the host knowing about it? Is that, do you have this notion between or the separation between host and and and, and uh, your container that you can run something in the container with PMI that the host doesn't know about, or maybe I misunderstand the question. But Josh, you. So it's my understanding with PMI one and PMI two that they're custom to the resource manager. Um, they provide a client side API um, that then is custom to say Slurm, and so you would need the one that's compatible with the resource manager that's there. Um, that being said, you could always run your own set of daemons on those nodes. Um, you know, use like MPI run to start up the ORTED or, or Orte daemons on the nodes and not use the host resource manager for that. Um, you're, it's not super efficient on big scales, right? Because you really do want to use the host resource manager for efficiency, but it allows you more flexibility in the PMI interface you want and need. And you could put all of that inside the container too, so you would kind of stuck at that level. But again, you're you're not using the the host system maybe as efficiently as you could. Okay. Does that help Ooh. address the question? Yeah, the, the motion is is typing in Slack. Oh, got the answer. Cool. All right. So two other things um, I would like to to talk about, like CDI, the the talk that uh, CJ gave, and the huge page support and I was just wondering, the huge page support, isn't it just a sub-problem of the device integration? Because you need to integrate a device, I guess, slash dev pages piece into the container to solve this. Is it something that should be done by default, or is it something that you need to decide on um, at, at the workload level, at the job per job level, if you want to have huge page support uh, or not? And I'm not an expert in this. Uh, yeah, for us, it was it, it should it should have been mandatory, right? It should have been in the startup files for for the container um, system. It's just that we, you know, that that when we were running the benchmarks, we actually had forgotten that we needed huge page um, support for MPI since it was integrated so long ago. Um, so yes, you're actually right. It's it's part of the infrastructure to set that up and make it sort of a mandatory config. So um, it was just a, a you know lessons learned type of thing when scaling containers, um, HPP systems for great. Okay, cool. And for for CDI, so and you you showed the um, the evolution of device integration in your slides pretty nicely, and the CDI just packages everything 
into a plugin and a lifecycle that can be yeah, that that is defined not as uh, like the early days where everyone was just mounting pieces from the host and hopes for the best. It's that's the direction, and this this is a fair like summary of of CDI that everything can be installed. The lifecycle is defined, and uh, the hooks are defined to to use those. Was that to me? Yeah, CJ. Sorry. Yeah. And, Yes, that seems to be the direction things are going, and so I, it's uh, it's very hopeful, I think. So being able to have everything that you need top to bottom with the um, you know CDI and support of the Kubernetes device plugins, and being able to define the hooks. Um, I didn't mention the talk, but uh, as we've been talking about in the Containers Advisory Council, uh, I think uh, a next step that we do want to establish is conventions around those hooks and how to work that and affirming that OCI spec is sufficient. Uh, we can challenge that um, specific cases and see where and whether and how we need any additional um, conventions around uh, the support for those hooks. That seems interesting. That, that just dovetails nicely within CDI. It's, it's part of the larger context. And will the CDI plugin install all the hooks as well, or is it something that you need to, need to set up on the runtime installation level? I believe that that's part of what uh, what you specify as, you know, if you look at the code example that I talked about there, um, it, it shows uh, the different, uh, you know, things that you need and where you're going to find them, right? You get them. You get the stuff that you need from the vendor uh, with a, a name vendor site and uh, tell it about the devices, and then it goes and installs whatever's needed. And I would assume that, that in, that's going to include the hooks as well. OK. All right. Um, fortunately, so, you know, in our, in our own case, we have hooks that we provide, and um, so that's that's among the things that sort of get installed and become available so all right cool something else you want to talk about guys or in the chat Eduardo wanted to talk about more uh, more about like CDI but I think I'm not sure what you wanted to talk I about I was wondering if um, Christian we could I had had a question about and it was it's partly to the, you know, the, the panelists that are come from the vendor community about is do you think there's a willingness to have um, sort of an abstraction library that goes into the containers that can interface to things outside in a more clean way? And I think maybe the NVIDIA drivers are already possibly doing this to some degree, but the idea would to be to have some flexibility and version skew, you know, between the two sides that they can negotiate, you know, what's, um, you know, what's supported and just to make images a little more, you know, they can run over longer periods of time and be more portable. Do you have more detail? Um, so, for example, I can build an image with, you know, this sort of generic NVIDIA, let's say CUDA library, you know, inside it, that when it, <clears throat> when the job would start up, it brings in the, a, a sort of a North Bridge interface from outside, you know, from the system. And the two can talk to each other to figure out what, you know, what capabilities are available in the installed, you know, driver and card combo or whatever uh, so that they can then it knows which things to kind of turn on in the container in the application so i uh figuring out what the best available match is and getting that installed into the container is a solved problem um, being able to get the right stuff onto 
the host platform uh, on top of Kubernetes uh, is uh, also um, something that I'll talk about um, later uh, in the next talk, um, and you can see that. So I think that's also kind of a solved problem. I think that the place that you're talking about is, so now I'm an application, and how does the application query some other standard ish interface about uh, what's mm -hmm. now available to me? Right, and, and which, yeah. and in particular, it's not a, you know, a, a CPU ID like thing, um, but rather, or or an LSPCI thing, but rather, <clears throat> I want this particular capability that's only available in versions of libraries greater than X. Mm -hmm. So then, I guess the question would be. Um, isn't that specific to whatever those libraries are? You know, there are ways I, I, to, to say, saying, you know, can I, rather I than go saying like, Kuda I want this version, yeah, it would be that what, what features can I make use of at runtime? And so then it can use those to run as, you know, efficiently as possible, right? And so, so, you know, so in it, a, I'm just using, I'm going to use a concrete example. In, in CUDA, you can go ask if, you, if you're using version 9.1 versus version 11, you can go query CUDA and say, hey, is, is this feature available? And CUDA will tell you because you're trying to use a CUDA feature. If you're trying to mm -hmm. use a Kuzi What's It feature, then it seems like you should go ask Kuzi What's It, you know, hey, tell me about your different versions and which version am I on? Right. I think it would be for any case where we have this kind of, um, need to know more detail about the system itself is having better interfaces for for that. Um, you know, if you think Such about, as, um, you know, so we, I, I'm thinking not about crazy, right? Just trying to be concrete. Right? Yeah, just trying to tear it down. And, you know, it's where do where do system specific details start to appear, right? So it might be, um, if you want to have sort of a generic MPI interface, but then it can determine like, oh, am I talking to, you know, an InfiniBand fabric or am I talking to a slingshot fabric? And then it can bring in the pieces that it it needs. So it's making sure that there's there's a clean interface at that layer that um, is has the right abstractions, and then they can negotiate. And it could be also that it could you know, negotiate. Does it have this uh, feature flag enabled for it, depending on you know, what firmware it's at or something, you know, anything that might cause some variation in, in capabilities from one system to the next. But so Josh, for example, can't you do that with MPIX? MPIX or PMIX? PMIX, right. Yes, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so PMIX can query a few things. Um, I wonder if what Shane's trying to get at is more of thinking about the interconnect driver. I had a use case in one of my slides where I said you could bring in just the driver piece from the system and like open MPI, you can bring in a component, binary component. Um, the discoverability around that, whether that's an appropriate component to use for the system yeah. um, is more of a runtime decision. And so we need to know that that component, all of the necessary libraries are there, like say the MoFed user space libraries, for example, are of the proper version levels for this. Um, mm. And there are certain ways, it, it depends, kind of like what CJ said, it depends on each individual um, library that you're interacting with, how much queryability you have um, in making that decision. And some are better than others, but having some best practices around that would be great, particularly for like OpenMPI and our selection logic, we can make it stronger so that maybe you have two different, you know, network adapters for two different versions, one tuned for say the new set of features and one for the older set of features. We need to know when we start to run what the individual kernel level driver is capable of so that we can make the appropriate right. choice. Well, here's um, a concrete example that is for OpenMPI, for example, you can, uh, OpenMPI, I believe the implementations, uh, some of them anyway, um, will then go and check, uh, hey, is the UCX driver present? And is the underlying uh, Mellanox driver of a late enough version to be supported exactly. such that I can do UCX over Mellanox, uh, which can be better uh, as an implementation than some other implementations? 
than and say the older all MXF That's all seamlessly done. I don't know what capabilities there are for the user to go query that. It's kind of like a, you know stuff that happens behind the curtain. But, but, but maybe uh, MPIX or whatever allows you to. Uh, I still got it wrong. MPIX um, uh, gives you the uh, ability to query that as well. A priori, if you want to find out what it is, I don't know. So PMIX does have some fabric interaction options um, that it's exploring as part of the new standard, um, if particularly for what we call an instant on operation where you don't have to do a wire up exchange that requires some interaction with the network device drivers in order to make that possible inside the application. We could use that same interface to maybe exchange some um, version and compatibility level information as well. Um, yeah. So that's certainly was something we could explore in the working groups. Yeah, but but I would I would like chime in and and, and throw in the discussion about what is do we do is this necessarily a runtime decision or can it be a distribution or orchestration decision? I mean, we don't need to do all of this at the runtime level if we know what host we are running on, what the system characteristics of the host is. We can either serve it an image or a different image that is. That is the right image for the for the job, or we can maybe also change the characteristics of the of the job, how it started, and and make this not a runtime decision, right? So, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's still you need an interaction between, I think, the application and the system in some way. So, I don't know. You could, I mean, you could put some of this in the orchestration layer, but uh, I think if you were to try to say, well, all different, you know, versions of OpenMPI just would get unwieldy, right? Whereas usually yeah. there's an ABI of some sort that you can rely on, and to the extent that that's durable, then you can use it. I mean, it seems yeah. like you really have two kind of durable interfaces that we were relying on for containers. There's the kernel itself, you know, like all the kernel interactions that you normally do with through system calls, for example. And then there's this trick we've been using of ABI compatibility compatibility and then bringing in libraries at runtime to 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 solve another set of issues um, you know maybe we need something you know a hybrid sort of in between potentially but I don't know if there's any the ABI thing has been working pretty well just in some edge cases we've seen it kind of fail well is there another um, ABI issue coming and that's the one addressed by uh, lib fabrics right so there are multiple network providers and you can use the Fabrics API to query what the system has, and you can switch it at runtime, right? Isn't it a late binding um, uh, interface? So there's the kernel, there's the networks, um, all these things you, you have to find out inside the container, you know, this, this compatibility statement. Um, There's going to be other devices out there that, that fall into the same camp, I'm sure. I mean, we touched on GPU support and library support. Uh, there's multiple GPU vendors out there now. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that the compatibility issue is, is um, a, a challenge going forward. Mm -hmm. But it's a challenge we need to keep pushing on and the idea of having you know, what Shane was talking about, one MPI library that has all possible interconnects is kind of too much to ask anybody. But if you had one base MPI library and that plug-in coming from the system that attaches appropriately, mm -hmm. or that's kind of the hybrid mode that I was noodling with in my presentation. So. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's what that meant. Okay. Yep. Yeah. But that, unfortunately, we require, you know, for the application developers to jump in also, you know, and put and make that part, correct? Why is that required? You can get a default. You can and should get a, a best available default uh, without any effort that you can then override if you really want to, right? Isn't At runtime, that the best of both worlds? You mean? Yeah. I mean, maybe I think that's what happens concrete. in OpenMPI, for example. It'll go and pick whatever. It'll use some heuristic to pick what it thinks is best on a particular platform. Right. Yes. But yeah. only from what it knows about. Right. Right. And so, for example, if we, you know, the trick we use for with mpitch on the craze with shifter and is, and I think the way Saurus is doing it too, 
is we're taking advantage of the ABI compatibility. So they can build it for a generic TCP IP network. And then at runtime, because of the ABI compatibility, we map in the, the systems in pitch and it says, oh, here's how I talk to, you know, the, the ARIES network. You know, without that, the performance would be horrible, right? And the user, the person packaging that container or that image may not even have access to the in-pitch libraries for the Cray. So they could have never built that image that way unless they went and picked the libraries off of the system. And as soon as they get to the next upgrade or something like that, then it, things can break again. So this is, you know, we've been able to get a lot of mileage off of this approach, but it's only because we're mapping these things in. So. If we if we go down with the um, the proposed solution of having everything in Git and kick off a CI/CD pipeline, you could bring your own container and then use the systems CI <coughs> library like attachment as an additional step and create a new container that has the system library in there, right? As as a maybe as a server, as a site provider as a systems provider that you have an additional step someone needs to do when he brings his own container he you create a new container with only adding the system component so that you don't need to hook it at runtime. I mean, if you think about volume mounting and setting the LD library path, you're kind of doing effectively that at runtime, right? Instead of building another layer that replaces those libraries, you're just mapping them in at, at runtime, right? So, and I would be hesitant to have everybody rebuild the image every time they move to a different system because I think, you know, as was alluded to during the build process, those things are not as reproducible as you would hope. And so I think there's a good chance that like, you build it one day, you get one thing and you build it the next day, you might get a different artifact, right? No, that's true. Okay, we have one question in the chat about NVIDIA visible devices and CUDA visible devices. That's something that I learned today as well. So. CJ, can you just uh, give us a 30 seconds or 60 seconds um, summary of the difference between the two? Yes. Uh, the and the slides will be available um, too, so you can look through that example again. Uh, NVIDIA visible devices basically manages uh, what's visible in the container, so you can pick out of the set of um, minor numbers that are exposed. Um, you can pick which ones you want, and then those are renumbered and presented as renumbered and contiguous set inside the container. And then once you're inside the container, uh, you can uh, further control who sees what with CUDA visible devices um, so that you can say, you know, I, I want this particular subset for this process so that each MPI rank, for example, running within the, pro within the uh, container can see its appropriate subset. And the, the other thing to go along with the CUDA visible devices is if you don't trust the user to spoof or mess with it, then you can use cgroups to enforce that. So it's normally the scheduler, if there is one in play, um, which sets the CUDA visible devices, and then it can enforce them with cgroups. But to like give an example of this, talk to you have maybe have four ranks within the container. You do NVIDIA visible devices for the like a subset of the eight GPUs you have. You will just give like zero, two, three, and five. Within the container, they will appear as zero to three, and then which for each individual rank you will display or like They'll use. Get renumbered so they would be zero, one, two. If it's if it's three or if it's four, anyhow. But if within the ranks, you would filter which what the ranks can see with CUDA visible device. Okay, cool. Uh, we are about to hit the top of the hour, so maybe like um, we can we can like maybe conclude with a final thought. Any like um, projections or any any thoughts you have for next year? What do you think we will talk about? What do you think we will not talk about? But we, we don't have much time, so maybe in a short one minute statement, what do you guys reckon for next year in the HPC department? PMI taking over the world? I, I'm interested in knowing how much further we can keep playing the MPH ABI trick. 
I'm really interested about that because uh, I have the feeling that we are starting to see the end of that one. Uh, we already had some cases where the where users bring uh, newer versions of mpeach. The ABI translation works, but they are using a feature that is not available on the host. So they're a little bit further ahead than the versioning uh, on the host. So that will be my my question, my open question for, for next year. Yeah, and that's certainly true as the MPI forum starts to finalize uh, MPI 4, right? There's some new features out there that applications are starting to use that are not quite standard yet, not quite everywhere yet. Um, so you have to worry about that. So um, I think the ABI issue is interesting to explore. It's a very tough nut to crack. I think in the next kind of did, there's a question in the next year, um, exploring applications that really are using these hybrid environments and have a traditional kind of HPC bare metal mentality connected to something in the cloud, either uh, private or public, will be really interesting to see filled out over the next year. Um, and then dealing with some of the cross version compatibility issues and maybe trying to make some best practices around that and thinking about user namespaces and how they interact. Certainly that's becoming much more mainstream and available now. I think we'll see a lot more activity around that. It'd be interesting to talk about how it influences HPC environments. Okay, CJ. Yeah, so one of the things I would say is uh, this is an HPC uh, grouping. And I think the notion of what HPC means is going to continue to get expanded. Um, it's going to get really muddy uh, because, as we talked about today, there are going to be these workflows. Um, workflows, I think, are going to become a bigger and bigger deal. And uh, whatever you used to be simple because it was just one app, one job doing it, is now going to get more complicated because you're going to span uh, these different subsets of resources and distributed environments that are all these people and identities and so on playing by different rules that never expected or never intended to be able to be used with one another. Um, that uh, the, the, you know, one definition of HPC is sort of scale up and scale out with discipline and rigor. And I think that uh, those of us that sort of grew up in an HPC world still have more to offer uh, even as uh, the sort of the boundaries of what gets layered onto or mixed in with HPC get significantly stretched and expanded. So there's a lot more. We don't know what we don't know yet. <laughs> okay. Shane and Jonathan, Bill? Um, I think I'm just going to echo what everyone said here. I think the next couple of years is going to all be about converged environments and, and how the infrastructures respond respond to that. And I, I think we're at the cusp of seeing how far these technologies will go. I, I still, I still have doubts that um, using using Kubernetes uh, language, the workflow languages, needs to be uh, enhanced. It's it's too cumbersome. So making it more user focused, or or what is the user experience? I think it's gonna is going to uh, be evolving rapidly in the next uh, you know year or so. Okay, Shane, some closing thoughts. I guess <clears throat> I'll just add that I, I I think that we will see continued improvement in some of these issues because containers are becoming such the sort of native way more and more things get run, and this will force the issue to the foreground and, and it'll have to be dealt with in some way, shape or form. But um, that I could see there still being some rocky periods in between. I think I agree with Lucas. I think the we have milked the ABI compatibility pretty, pretty well. And I think we, you know, things like the glibc issue, you start to see little chips at the edges. Um, but, you know, if you think a, a five year life cycle out of a, an image that's pretty that's a big improvement on where uh, communities were before but you, I think we can still do better cool all right then um, I will thank everyone and put on the music for like three minutes and we will continue with the last segment for the workshop series
I will see you guys in three minutes. Thanks Thank for the you. panel. Yeah, and thanks. Thank you.